Inauguration, 1961. your presence is requested at the ceremonies attending the inauguration of the President and the Vice President of the United States, January 20th, 1961. Members of the Joint Congressional Inaugural Committee, Senator John Sparkman, Chairman, Senator Carl Hayden, Senator Stiles Bridges, and our leader, Charles A. Halleck. Upon the arrival of President-elect Kennedy's party, President Eisenhower went out to greet him and escorted his party into the White House. They were followed by Vice President Nixon, Mrs. Nixon, Senator Stiles Bridges, and Representative Charles Halleck. The photographers were extremely busy as the remainder of the party arrived and entered the White House. As the time for the inaugural approach, the entire party left the White House, led by Vice President Nixon, Vice President-elect Lyndon Johnson, Senator Carl Hayden, and Representative John W. McCormick. More activity on the part of the cameramen as Mrs. Nixon, Mrs. Johnson, and Congressman Halleck depart. Mrs. Mamie Eisenhower and Mrs. Jackie Kennedy, escorted by Senator Stiles Bridges, are next to leave. They are immediately followed by President Eisenhower, President-elect Kennedy, and Senator John Sparkman, as well as other members of the Joint Congressional Inaugural Committee. A parting salute by the military aides. The entire party leaves the White House grounds for its relatively short trip to Capitol Hill. Crews had worked all night long to clear the heavy snowfall. This inauguration was one of the coldest to be witnessed in many, many years. Members of the House of Representatives were preceded by Kenneth R. Harding, Deputy Sergeant-at-Arms in charge of the mace. This is an indication that it really was cold. Representative Joseph W. Martin, former speaker, minority leader, and presently representative from Massachusetts. Senator Everett Dirksen, Minority Leader, Senator Mike Mansfield, Majority Leader, lead the members of the United States Senate. Former President Truman is escorted by Senator Clinton Anderson. More members of the United States Senate. Former Senator from Rhode Island, Theodore Francis Green. Robert Kennedy, who was to be the next Attorney General. Ted Kennedy, another brother of the President-to-be. Members of the United States Supreme Court arrive on the stands. Eisenhower and Mrs. Nixon, followed by Mrs. Johnson, followed by Mrs. Kennedy.
the Joint Congressional Inaugural Committee having escorted, now seat the presidential parties on the platform. remained hushed until the completion of America the Beautiful. Thank you. 
His Eminence Archbishop Jacobus will now lead us in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Almighty and all merciful Lord, by whom all powers and authorities are ordained, who taught us that rulers are ministers of God to us for all that is good, who demandest of us that we offer supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving for all who are in authority, hear us, O Lord, for unto thee do we bow submissively inclining our heads and entreating thy mercy upon thy faithful servant, our beloved President, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. will now administer the oath of office to the vice president-elect. and appreciation of a grateful people. Now I have the honor to present one of America's most distinguished poets who will deliver an original composition, Mr. Robert Frost. Robert Frost, one of America's great living poets, gave from memory one of his own poems entitled, Gift Outright. The oath of office will now be administered to the president-elect by the Chief Justice of the United States. Thank 
John Fitzgerald Kennedy do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Vice President Johnson, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chief Justice, President Eisenhower, Vice President Nixon, President Truman, Reverend Clergy, fellow citizens. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. The world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary belief for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. <laughs> Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. <laughs> this much we pledge and more. To those old allies, whose cultural and spiritual origins we share, we pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do. For we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. We shall not always expect to find them supporting our view, but we shall always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom. And to remember that in the past, those who foolishly sought power 
by riding the back of the tiger, ended up inside. <laughs> to those people in the huts and villages of half the globe, struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. For whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. <laughs> to our sister republic, south of our border, we offer a special pledge to convert our good words into good deeds. In a new alliance for progress, to assist free men and free government in casting off the chains of poverty. But this peaceful revolution of hope cannot become the prey of hostile powers. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas. And let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. <laughs> to that World Assembly of Sovereign States, the United Nations, our last best hope in an age where the instruments of war have far outpaced the instruments of peace, we renew our pledge of support to prevent it from becoming merely a forum for invective, to strengthen its shield of the new and the weak, and to enlarge the area in which its writ may run. Finally, to those nations who would make themselves our adversary, we offer not a pledge, but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace. Before the dark powers of destruction, unleashed by science, engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. We dare not tempt them with weakness, for only when our arms are sufficient beyond doubt can we be certain beyond doubt that they will never be employed? But neither can two great and powerful groups of nations take comfort from our present course, both sides overburdened by the cost of modern weapons, both rightly alarmed by the steady spread of the deadly atom, yet both racing to alter that uncertain balance of terror that stays the hand of mankind's final war. So let us begin anew. Remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Let both sides explore what problems unite us instead of belaboring those problems which divide us. Let both sides, for the first time, formulate serious and precise proposals for the inspection and control of arms and bring the absolute power to destroy other nations under the absolute control of all nations. Let both sides seek to invoke the wonders of science instead of its terrors. Together, let us explore the stars, conquer the desert, eradicate disease, tap the ocean depth, and encourage the arts and commerce. Let both sides unite to heed in all corners of the earth the command of Isaiah to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free.
And if a beachhead of cooperation may push back the jungle of suspicion, let both sides join in creating a new endeavor, not a new balance of power, but a new world of law where the strong are just and the weak secure and the peace preserved. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call to service surround the globe. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though in battle we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, a struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. Can we forge against these enemies a grand and global alliance, north and south, east and west, that can assure a more fruitful life for all mankind? Will you join in that historic effort? In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. <laughs> Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us here the same high standards of strength and sacrifice, which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own.
We turn to thee, O Heavenly Father, in deepest thanksgiving for this exalting day of reaffirmation of our nation's ideals and unity and of personal avowal of sacred obligation by our president and vice president in thy name. O thou to whom alone belong the dominion and the power, mayest thou ever be their stay and support. Rabbi Gleck ended his benediction on a note of prayer for the success of the incoming administration. the Star-Spangled Banner. The stepped up pace of the now President John F. Kennedy is perhaps an indication of the pace in government that lies ahead. He is followed by his lovely wife Jackie, Lyndon Johnson, former senator from Texas and majority leader of the set now Vice President of the United States, and Mr. Democrat Harry Truman, all hasten to the Supreme Court chamber for lunch. As is customary, the Joint Congressional Inaugural Committee provides a luncheon in the historic old Supreme Court chamber in the Capitol for the new chief executive and his party. The invitation list to this affair comprises a notable array of the leaders in and out of government, all eager to congratulate the new presidential family. The chefs uncover the chafing dishes. The head table is laid out in readiness for the hungry dignitaries. The center motif on the table is an American eagle carved from ice. In the serving line, we see Senator Stiles Bridges of New Hampshire, Joe Duke, Sergeant at Arms of the Senate, and Senator Leverett Saltonstall of Massachusetts, former colleague of the President when he was in the Senate. Senator Henry Jackson of Washington. Senator George Smathers of Florida. Bob
Bobby Baker, secretary to the majority. Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota. Henry Wallace, former vice president of the United States. Robert Frost, the poet. The majority and minority leaders of the Senate, Mike Mansfield and Everett McKinley Dirksen, were only a few of the many notables. The new chief executive and his wife leave the Capitol accompanied by Senator John Sparkman, chairman of the Joint Congressional Inaugural Committee, to enter the awaiting sedan that will now lead the inaugural caravan to the reviewing stands in front of the White House. Immediately behind is the vice president and his wife. Down historic Pennsylvania Avenue, the caravan proceeds. This trip is symbolic of the ascension to power of the new administration as the reins of government change hands. The president's car passes the reviewing stand and he waves to his proud parents waiting for him to take his place in the presidential reviewing box. Chief Justice Earl Warren, former President Truman and his family, Three United States military academies, representing the best of American men, are led by the cadets from West Point, all soon to play vital roles as our military leaders to come. Future officers of our mighty air arm follow next, the cadets from our Air Force Academy. Middies from the Naval Academy of Annapolis, our powerful Sea Amada's leaders in the years ahead. For many hours, the endless parade of marchers pass in review before the new leaders of our land. The president and vice president stand for them all. Once a naval officer himself with a distinguished war record, the president watches with heightened interest as the Navy band passes in review. Here are two men, two men who lead one of the greatest nations on earth in its most trying period. An era fraught with peril, where man's struggle for freedom is challenged by a godless tyranny. The leaders of a nation that symbolizes man's right to the determination of who shall govern him. That determination has been made by the people of America. They stand before you. Our thanks are expressed to the Joint Congressional Inaugural Committee and its staff director, Franklin Dryden, for their able assistance rendered in the preparation of this documentary film. <laughs>